Okay, thank you everyone for coming uh, on this still slightly rainy <coughs> afternoon. I'm Michael Green. I'm the Senior Vice President for Asia here at CSIS and a professor at Georgetown and a good friend, like many of you, of Joseph Wu. Um, we are um, privileged to have Joseph here uh, to brief us in person on the report of the China Affairs Committee, um, Expanded Meetings on China Policy under the 2014 China Policy Review. Joseph has a uh, PowerPoint briefing and um, after that, we'll have a brief discussion up here and then open it up to the floor for questions and answers. Um, I was previously in government in the National Security Council uh, staff of President George W. Bush and uh, during a DPP government uh, in Taipei. And Joseph, in his role as the head of the MAC, Mainland Affairs Council, and uh, the representative here, was one of our go-to guys, uh, someone we could always rely on for not only a straight a description of what was happening in Taipei um, uh, in terms of uh, the policy, the politics, the strategy, but also someone who would help us solve problems and uh, add some uh, um, clarity and common purpose between Washington and Taipei going forward. Um, one of the challenges in those days, um, but it's still a challenge, uh, is um, uh, understanding uh, how uh, policy towards the mainland will unfold. And a lot of uh, Washington pundits uh, demand that uh, the DPP have an absolutely clear and predictable China policy that's very convenient for us, uh, as if uh, there were no domestic politics um, in a fellow democracy. Um, and uh, so it's not an easy thing to do. But nevertheless, I think there's a broad consensus in Washington that we need a bit more predictability in how uh, not only the blue camp, but the green camp, the DPP, uh, are thinking about China, how the policy is evolving. And this um, report is a uh, heroic effort to do that. Um, the press has said either, depending on where they come from, it's too much. Joseph Wu is a dangerous man, or it's not enough. <laughs> Joseph Wu is not ambitious enough. The DPP should do more. Um, Joseph will tell us more, but I view this as an evolutionary step towards building uh, consensus. We may not quite have the 2014 consensus, but it's a step in the right direction, it seems to me, and one that should be of interest uh, to people in Washington who care about um, our friendship with Taiwan and peace and security in uh, um, East Asia as a whole. So Joseph's going to give us the brief. Um, I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll turn this into an LY session, oh. and people can <laughs> throw questions at him, but not food. <laughs> And no shoes. Uh, Joseph, uh, thank you for coming back to CSIS, and, uh, and the floor is yours. Look forward to it. You can use the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for the uh, very elaborative uh, introduction. I'm honored, and I'm very happy to be back in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm especially happy to be able to come to the CSIS uh, for this uh, briefing. Uh, the reason why we want to come over here to Washington, D.C. to uh, brief you in person about the uh, 2014 uh, China uh, Policy Review is because uh, this is a major development in the DPP. And I think uh, the more I can explain, the better you can understand about the DPP uh, or where the DPP is from. Uh, the 2014 China Policy Review uh, was completed uh, last week and was accepted by the uh, China Affairs Committee of the DPP last Thursday. Uh, but before I go into the details of the uh, China uh, Policy Review or the China uh, Affairs Committee, I think I need to explain to you a little bit about why we have this China Policy Committee or we want to do a review on our China policy. And I think the reason is because let me see. Let me hit this. Oh, okay. Oh, the reason is because there is a general uh, background, general context that uh, we need to look at in more detail. And there's a general context that we uh, worry a little bit uh, that prompts the uh, DPP to look at our relations with China more. And the general context is that uh, um, China seems to be growing quite rapidly. Uh, it's growing militarily, and it's also growing with its uh, political 
leverage, political influence, political power, and also its economic might. And this is the first factor that we need to face. It's very different from the older days uh, when the DPP was still in office. Uh, maybe China was rising at the time, but its influence today is much more than uh, what it was uh, when the DPP was in the office. And there's also growing tension in uh, East Asia, especially in the East China Sea. Uh, if we look at the Diao Yitai uh, area, uh, there was several moments that we thought that it was coming very close to a real conflict situation. And I think the uh, situation is still uh, going very bad uh, in uh, East Asia. And we need to pay a lot of attention to uh, what's going on in East Asia. And I think there's also a new regulation over South China Sea by China requiring the fishing boats, not only the Chinese fishing boats, but also other international fishing boats uh, to register to the Chinese authorities. Otherwise, they will face a stiff penalty. And I think this is all raising uh, tension in uh, East Asia. And this is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, one of the new things, uh, one of the new development in East Asia, of course, is the alias issue. Uh, the Chinese government made the announcement on the 23rd of November last year, and this heightened the tension in East Asia. And we, if we put the, all this uh, as a background for us to understand about Taiwan's relations with China, and I think we need to ask in a very careful way uh, if uh, China is making tension or uh, it, if uh, the tension is heightened, uh, which side are we on? or are we dealing with the issue in a proper manner? Or is Taiwan uh, being prepared enough to deal with the issue? And of course, if you look at the tension in East Asia, including the East China Sea and South China Sea, uh, maybe uh, there's one question that uh, a lot of people would like to ask is uh, whether Xi Jinping uh, making any difference. And I would like to show you a chart to see whether this chart would make sense. I try to uh, give you a chronological, chronological uh, chart of uh, what's going on in uh, South China Sea or East China Sea. And you can probably uh, tell that uh, before the dotted line, it was before Xi Jinping came to power as the uh, state president. Uh, you can see the small skirmishes, like um, they try to confront uh, the US uh, survey boats. Uh, but after Xi Jinping came to power, uh, you can see an escalation, you know, for example, uh, the escalation over Diao Yitai, or the announcement of the Aries, or uh, the announcement of the new rules on the South China Sea fishing. And therefore, you can see that Xi Jinping seemed to be making a difference. But there's also a long-term trend, if, if you see the whole chart, and whole uh, chronicles, that the tension has already been there, uh, except that uh, when Xi Jinping came to power, uh, the tension seems to be getting worse, and Xi Jinping seemed to, adopt, seemed to have adopted a new strategy of uh, trying to extend China's uh, sovereignty claim in East Asia or in, or in the East China Sea or South China Sea. And under these kinds of circumstances, uh, the normal situation will be that Taiwan has to try to find the best position uh, in its relations with China, in its relations with Japan or the United States or other countries in the area. Uh, and we will always have to ask one question. This is a key question we have to ask all the time. When there's a tension between China and Japan, and when there's tension in between China and the United States, or there's a tension in between China and other Southeast Asian countries, where is Taiwan on? Which side is Taiwan on? And if people started to feel maybe Taiwan is too much on the side of China, then there we might have some problem. And normally speaking, or rationally speaking, the United States is the best friend of Taiwan. And China is the only source of uh, threat against Taiwan. And therefore, what we need to do uh, under the circumstances that there's tension in East Asia is that we need to strengthen our security ties. We need to strengthen our economic ties with the United States, which is the most important to Taiwan. And we also have to uh, increase our relations with Japan and the Philippines, our immediate neighbors. And at the same time, we also need to try 
uh, very hard to reconcile with China, but in a very careful manner. After all, China has that uh, motivation against Taiwan, uh, and they want to incorporate Taiwan, and they've been there. Uh, they have said it in a very blunt way, so we have to be very careful. But if you look at uh, Taiwan-China relations in 2013, you probably feel that uh, the picture is not exactly the same as what I just described, that Taiwan should have a more rational uh, calculation on where it stands in East Asia. Uh, this is a chart that shows high-level meetings in between Taiwan and China. Uh, in March, Lian Zhan went to Beijing and he met with Xi Jinping. And in April, uh, Xiao Wanchang, uh, Vincent Xiao, went to Hainan Island for the Boao meeting and he met with uh, uh, Xi Jinping. And in June, there was a straight forum, this high-level forum uh, in uh, Fujian province. They do this every year and there's always uh, more than 10,000 uh, people from Taiwan participating in this uh, straight forum. And in June, uh, Wu Boxiong, uh, the honorary chairman of the KMT, uh, also went to Beijing and he met with uh, Xi Jinping. And in October, Vincent Xiao met with uh, Xi Jinping in APEC, in Bali. And in October, there was a peace forum in Shanghai. And in, uh, in November, there was a Zijinshan forum in Nanjing. And in December, there was an economic cooperation meeting under uh, ECFA. Uh, that, held, that was held in Taipei. And in December, there was also media prospect uh, forum uh, that was held in Beijing. So if you put all this together, you see that Taiwan and China are meeting frequently and the level of the meeting are, uh, is very high. And next year, uh, the coming February, next month, uh, the Men and Affairs Council Chairman, uh, Wang Yiqi, will travel to Shanghai and he will meet with uh, uh, Taiwan Affairs Office Director Zhang Zijun, and this is another one of those high-level meetings. And maybe there will be uh, other high-level meetings coming up. Uh, for example, there's a, a possibility that uh, Ma ying the president of Taiwan, uh, may attend uh, the coming APEC meeting in Beijing, and he will have a chance to meet with uh, Xi Jinping. So if you look at all this chart, you see that Taiwan's relations with China is far beyond Taiwan's relations with any other country. You know, uh, the country as important as the United States, you know, we don't have these kinds of high-level meetings, but we have high-level meetings with China. And this is something that we need to uh, pay attention to. Uh, There's also uh, a question about uh, Ma Ying-jeou meeting Xi Jinping. Uh, we have been asking this question in Taiwan, whether uh, Ma Ying-jeou meeting Xi Jinping is a good thing or not. Uh, without considering any other factor, uh, China is the one that has been threatening Taiwan all these years. And if there can be high-level meeting in between uh, the Chinese officials and the Taiwanese officials, under normal circumstances, this would be very good. And it will be a signal or a sign of the cross-rate normalization. And therefore, if Taiwan's status is not affected, or if Taiwan's interests can be safeguarded, uh, even the opposition in Taiwan will not oppose to uh, the high-level meeting. We would even welcome the high-level meeting. But in order for us to make sure that Taiwan's interest is not uh, affected, we need to ask some uh, key questions. For example, uh, what, kind of, what kind of conditions have we being agreeing to the Chinese side in order for this high-level meeting to take place, or what will come out in the meeting. Uh, there was a report uh, from Taiwan, a senior uh, National Security Bureau official was saying to the press that uh, China is already preparing for a joint statement uh, for the Xi Jinping and uh, Ma Ying-jeou meeting. And we have to be uh, very cautious on this. Uh, you know, if, if something comes out that is not in Taiwan's interest, then we have to be uh, very careful. We have to uh, prepare for something like this uh, in order to prevent Taiwan's interest from uh, being affected. And I think we also need to think about the possible uh, implication, strategic implication for uh, Xi Jinping and Ma ying meeting with Taiwan's interest being affected or Taiwan's strategic interest with the United States being affected by this uh, uh, senior level meeting. If we flash back uh, just a year and a half uh, to what happened after uh, 
September 2012, uh, there was a conflict in between Taiwan and Japan uh, over fishing rights. Uh, there was a sh water cannon shooting incident. Uh, you know, Taiwan doesn't seem to be on the side of the uh, alliance between uh, the United States and Japan. And there was also a fishing boat, uh, you know, fish, fishery conflict in between Taiwan and the Philippines, uh, which is another one of uh, the U.S. ally. And uh, Taiwan government is sending uh, kick class destroyers and Mirage 2000 to intimidate uh, your ally. And then the ADIZ issue, uh, a lot of people in Taiwan feel that uh, maybe Taiwan government is uh, reacting too soft and too slow to the situation. Uh, for instance, Taiwan's uh, Civil Aviation Administration just submitted the material requested by China without checking with the United States or Japan or Korea on what they're going to do. There was a lack of coordination with all these key countries. And therefore, if Taiwan and China is getting too close without uh, having uh, our strategic interests in our picture, uh, that might affect uh, Taiwan's real interest or affect uh, Taiwan's key friends' interests, like the United States or Japan. Uh, we also need to ask this question. Let me see. Uh, we also need to ask the question uh, whether the conditions between Taiwan and China have met on a high-level meeting, or what kind of exchanges uh, have been going on in the languages they use. And this is a, a chart that I come up with uh, to show you uh, the kind of languages uh, between Taiwan and China have been using uh, that seem to have come to a point where they can agree with something uh, for more serious meetings to take place, like uh, for Wang Yiqi to uh, travel to Shanghai to meet with uh, Zhang Zijun. Uh, beginning from March, Lian Zhang mentioned about uh, One China, Yiga Zhongguo, uh, Renaissance of the Chinese Nation, Zhenqing Zhonghua, and he also spoke about an effective framework uh, for political, uh, effective cross trade political framework. And Xi Jinping, in return, by saying that uh, the two sides should jointly maintain the One China framework. And in April, uh, Mind Zhou was saying that there, there should be no uh, there should be no uh, two Chinas, no one China, one Taiwan, no China alone, Taiwan independence. And in June, Wu Bo was saying that uh, uh, according to each uh, framework or constitutional framework or uh, legal framework of Taiwan and China, uh, both indicated that it has a one China framework. Uh, and in July, Mind Zhou was saying that uh, both sides insist upon one China principle. That's a letter he sent to uh, Xi Jinping in return for Xi Jinping's congratulatory remarks for his uh, re-election uh, as the KMT chairperson. And I should bring to your attention that uh, both sides would insist <coughs> upon one China principle is uh, the interpretation of the Chinese side on 1992 consensus. And Taiwan has been resisting that uh, beginning from Li Denghui era. He says, no, this is not true in uh, 1992. And of course, the DPP administration did not accept this. But uh, Mind Zhou, uh, at this occasion, accepted the Chinese interpretation of the 1992 consensus. And then they go on and on, and it seems to me that the one China framework uh, has become the common language. And if both sides agree to the one China framework, uh, there seems to be uh, the conditions on the two sides have met with each other to allow the senior uh, government officials to meet with each other, uh, for example, for uh, Wang Yiqi to be able to travel to China. And under these circumstances, when the DPP look at what's going on in Taiwan or what's going on in between Taiwan and China and the regional dynamics, uh, we try very carefully and we try very comprehensively to think about Taiwan's strategic picture. And we know that Taiwan's uh, strategic priority may be shifting to China. As I indicated to you, the high-level meetings in between Taiwan and China has been going on very frequently, but there's not as much in between Taiwan and the United States, and therefore we need to reset our strategic priority. And in order to show to the people in Taiwan 
that uh, we pay more attention to our strategic priority of our democratic partners. Uh, we tried to arrange uh, Chairperson Su's visit to other fellow democracies, you know, to Japan, to uh, the United States, and we're also uh, traveling to Europe very soon uh, to make sure that people understand that these countries are very important to Taiwan and we have to keep these fellow democracies in mind. And we should also try to strengthen Taiwan's defense capabilities. You know, Taiwan's defense capabilities have been lagging behind. The government hasn't uh, invested enough. And uh, what we tried to do is to come up with sets of uh, defense uh, blue papers. We had the first set in June last year, and uh, we are coming up with a second set uh, which is coming at the end of February. And I'll be here again to report about uh, the second set of the blue papers. And the third issue area that we try very hard is to look at Taiwan's overall relations with China from all aspects, political, economic, social, or security aspect, uh, to look at our relations with China in a very comprehensive manner. And this is where the uh, China Affairs Committee coming in. And uh, I will also explain a little bit about the China Affairs Committee. Uh, it was a party organization with the organization rules adopted by uh, the Central Standing Committee on November uh, 21st, uh, 2012. And therefore, this is a party organization. It's a permanent organization rather than an ad hoc. Uh, organization that deal with uh, issues at a certain time. It will continue to exist. It will continue to function. It will continue to discuss and deliberate uh, anything that is related to China. And there were rounds of uh, meetings with uh, more than 30 uh, advisors. They are the specialists on the cross trade relations. They continue to meet and they'll come up with an agenda for the uh, committee to consider. And the first committee meeting was uh, May 9th, 2013, and the fifth committee meeting, which is uh, taking place last uh, Thursday. Uh, and, and between all these uh, committee meetings, we also held uh, expanded meetings, and this is at the request of some of the members of the China Affairs Committee. And we had nine expanded meetings uh, throughout uh, this period of time. And the participants would include more than 600 specialist party officials and even people uh, from different backgrounds. And I would love to uh, talk about this. I invited Suchi to come to address on the issue of 1992 consensus. And he agreed to come. And we were very happy that uh, people uh, from different backgrounds have a chance to uh, dialogue with each other. We also invite uh, other uh, scholars from the pen blue background. We also invite uh, people from Hong Kong, uh, invite people from China, uh, not only the Chinese dissidents, but also the Chinese students who are studying in Taiwan. So we try to bring in as many people as possible into this course of uh, dialogues in, in Taiwan. And as far as I can remember, this is the most extensive effort in Taiwan on any single issue area. And uh, last Thursday, uh, the uh, report, uh, the China Policy Review, uh, was completed and uh, passed by the uh, members of the committee. And I would like to uh, bring to your attention that this is not the end of our effort because there are still more issues that we need to work on. And the China's Affair, China Affairs Committee, as I said to you a little bit earlier, is a party organization and it will continue to function and we will continue to ask the committee to meet in an interval of once every two months to discuss uh, very uh, serious issues in between Taiwan and China. And the most likely scenario in the coming months is that we will arrange uh, topics for discussion or for debate uh, for the China Affairs Committee. And if they think that the uh, debate will be appropriate in the next stage, there will be debate. And if they think that uh, extensive discussions, closed source discussions uh, is more appropriate, and then we'll arrange for closed door discussions. And about this finding or the uh, uh, China Policy Review Summary Report, uh, some of you may have a chance to read it beforehand, and some of you might have a chance to have it in your hand, and we'll read it a little bit later. Uh, this is a summary of uh, the findings, and I think you can uh, find some of the uh, goodwills uh, 
in this uh, summary report. And this goodwill is uh, what we put into this report to show to the Chinese side that uh, we are willing to reconcile, uh, even though we are not giving up some of the core uh, values or fundamental positions on the DPP side. Uh, the first part of the report actually is not this yet, it's the foreword. Uh, and uh, some of us worked on the foreword, uh, realized that maybe this is the first page or the first paragraph the Chinese side will read. And therefore, uh, we need to be very careful to show them our true intention, but at the same time also to show them uh, that there's goodwill uh, in, in this foreword. And there were scholars in Taiwan uh, continue to tell us that uh, we need to show to them that we are in good faith in uh, having exchanges with China. So we did that. And I'm sure if you read the first paragraph and the second paragraph, uh, you will feel that uh, this is a, a very moderate wording of uh, uh, the description of the China Affairs Committee. And then uh, the second part of the uh, China Policy Review is the core principle or fundamental principles and core values. And the finding after rounds of discussions, either in the committee itself or in the expanded meetings, uh, we realize that uh, these uh, principles or the values are being accepted by the majority of the people in Taiwan, and there's really no need for us to make any modification on. Uh, these principles will include that Taiwan is already independent. You know, Taiwan is not ruled by any other country. Taiwan is ruled by itself. You know, Taiwan has its own president, which is democratically elected. Taiwan has its parliament, which is also democratically elected. And uh, the government in Taiwan exercises exclusive jurisdiction over the territory and its control. And therefore, this is a reality, and we don't don't have any need to change that. And the second is Taiwan is already a democracy and therefore any kind of uh, resolution to the future uh, relations between Taiwan and China needs to be uh, adopted by the people in Taiwan through democratic means. The change of the status quo, which Taiwan is not part of China or Taiwan is de facto independent, also needs to be approved by the people in Taiwan through democratic means. And I think it's very simple is that Taiwan is already a democracy. And when we try uh, to uh, check with the public opinion surveys in Taiwan, uh, we do that very often, uh, we found that majority of the people in Taiwan do agree with us on these two fundamental principles. So we try uh, to tell the public that we are uh, reaffirming uh, these two core principles. Sorry. And the Part following the uh, fundamental positions is the political uh, relations between Taiwan and China. And this is a part that we had lots of discussions, either in the expanded meetings or in the uh, committee meetings, uh, especially in the last round of committee meetings. Um, these are uh, the abbreviation of uh, what came out in the report. And I'm sure you have the uh, report itself so you can uh, read. Uh, more extensively on what we had in our conclusion. But I would like to uh, bring to your attention on the second uh, conclusion of uh, political exchanges uh, reached by the committee on last Thursday. Uh, the first one is about the exchanges in between the think tanks in Taiwan and think tanks in China. Uh, the principle that we had was that we should uh, deal with China or have exchanges with China from a self-confident perspective. We need to engage them uh, confidently. And the think tank uh, exchanges with China or the track two dialogues in between Taiwan and China is something that we can look forward to. And it's not just uh, the pen green think tanks or pen blue think tanks. It also uh, would include the party think tank, the New Frontier Foundation. And this is the first time ever that the DPP has authorized its own think tank to uh, be able to engage China. So we can look forward to more scholarly exchanges between Taiwan and China. And another point is uh, intercity exchanges. Uh, Kaohsiung Mayor Chen Ju uh, was in China a little bit earlier, but she was a little bit concerned whether this is in line with the party position uh, in engaging China. And this is a definite response to her that we would encourage intercity exchanges between uh, our local government and the Chinese local governments. And the reason is because we are confident in engaging China. 
And another one that is a slight deviation from the uh, earlier draft or the um, preliminary conclusion we submitted to the committee before uh, last Thursday. Uh, the original language was uh, based on the uh, consensus of constitutionalism. Uh, we uh, can have dialogues with China. But there was a lot of debate in the uh, committee meeting, and we cannot agree upon this. Some people uh, say something else, and then uh, the conclusion of the committee meeting is that uh, we should probably uh, take that out and uh, leave it open for future discussions. And then the wording is like this. Uh, we uh, should seek internal consensus to form the basis for cross-strait uh, dialogues. So it, the door is still open for future discussions on those key issues, whether it's constitution or constitutionalism that can be the basis for cross-strait dialogues, or anything else. Uh, Chairperson Tsai mentioned about Taiwan equals to Ch Republic of China and the Republic of China equals to Taiwan. And she says that uh, maybe that is something that we can discuss in the future as well. And the uh, uh, next part is the economic relations uh, in between Taiwan and China. Uh, even though a lot of people in Taiwan worry about the extensive economic relations or Taiwan depending on China too much. But I think it's uh, good to show to the international society or show to the Chinese side that, that we will not scrap the uh, economic agreements in between Taiwan and China if the DPP has a chance to come back to power. So uh, you can see from the wording here, Taiwan should continue to examine the existing agreements to ensure their effective implementation. And then based upon the existing agreements, we should try to uh, open Taiwan's door for more FTAs or uh, TPP or RCEP. That means uh, we will not, uh, we will honor the existing agreements, but at the same time, we also recognize Taiwan's concentration of its economic interest in China is, may not be in Taiwan's interest and we should diversify. So this is uh, uh, the uh, conclusion on the economic part. And then there's also uh, civic society, uh, civil society, uh, relations in between Taiwan and China. And this is an entirely new perspective. You know, we have scholars in Taiwan who stress very much on the civil society. They think that uh, China's civil society is uh, rising, it's just started, and it's very important for us to uh, link up with them, for us to pay attention to them so that they can learn from our experience. So we uh, draw from uh, their experiences or their suggestions into uh, this section. So you can see the wording uh, that is very much like uh, the uh, scholarly work that Taiwan should serve as a beacon to future China's development, and not only China, but also Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong Democrats are coming to us these days, and they think that uh, Taiwan uh, should pay more attention to Hong Kong. And some of the participants from Hong Kong in the uh, expanded meetings also made that call. And this is a direct answer to them, that we do pay attention to the development in Hong Kong. And I think there's also something here that we would like to show to the Chinese side or show to the international community that the DPP will pursue cross-rate relations in good faith on the social uh, dimension. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Chinese spouses in Taiwan, Chinese students, and there are also uh, millions of uh, Chinese visitors to Taiwan on an annual basis. And we should try to formulate a more friendly environment in Taiwan uh, to make sure that they understand how democracy functions so that they would enjoy Taiwan's openness and they can become Taiwan's best partners uh, in uh, Taiwan's democratic society. And on the national security part uh, should have uh, no surprises uh, because Taiwan's uh, national security is uh, uh, very important. And we feel that uh, our national security has been threatened by China. And we, we feel that uh, Taiwan's defense is not keeping, pay, keeping pace. And we need to uh, strengthen our security uh, capability. And we especially need to have more investment uh, in the national security, uh, especially in uh, asymmetrical warfare, uh, to make sure that Taiwan has that uh, ability to defend itself. And we also think that uh, in the last few years, we paid more attention to China than to uh, our uh, democratic partners. And uh, we propose that Taiwan should pursue its foreign policy based on values of 
uh, freedom and human rights and democracy. And basically, this is uh, the last part of our uh, report. And there's also um, implications uh, that I can think of uh, in uh, reading or in, in the presenting our uh, China policy review. Uh, the implication, for example, for the DPP, this is uh, an open forum. The China Affairs, China Affairs Committee is an open forum, not only for the DPP, but for Taiwan in general. And for the DPP, this forum will continue to exist and it will continue to debate on uh, the uh, China related issues. And this is not only an uh, ad hoc uh, type of arrangement to deal with presidential election. You know, normally uh, the case is that uh, we need to come up with a new set of principles in dealing with presidential election rather than dealing with China in a more serious manner. And we don't have a presidential election until 2016. And this is a real effort in thinking about how we should uh, deal with China. And this will continue to exist. There may be more debates or discussions in the China Affairs Committee. Uh, and uh, the next round will be uh, two months from now. And for Taiwan, uh, this is also uh, something that we can look forward to. Uh, the China Affairs Committee serves as a very good model for rational discussions, rational discourse, deliberations on uh, any important and controversial issues, uh, not only on uh, China, but also on other public issues. Uh, if the DPP can uh, organize a forum like China Affairs Committee to allow different opinions, different voices, people with different background to discuss a China-related issue, maybe on other issue areas, we can also organize committees like this or open forums like this and maybe this can serve as a model for the government to follow. Maybe the government should also think about a forum like this to allow people with DPP background uh, to participate in the government's deliberation on policy issue areas. And I think this is also very important for China. Uh, China will go through this uh, uh, policy review and I'm sure they will be able to understand Taiwan a whole lot better. Uh, after all, uh, when we go through the uh, public opinion surveys, our fundamental positions or core principles have been uh, accepted by the majority of the people. And in the deliberation, uh, we also put in a lot of uh, opinions into this effort. And therefore, China can understand Taiwan a whole lot more through studying very carefully about the China policy review. And I think for the international community, this is also a very good chance to see how the opposition uh, engaged in soul searching about one uh, policy issue area. And uh, also important for the international community to see that the DPP and opposition in Taiwan is ready to shoulder its future responsibilities. And I'll uh, end at this point to uh, take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, uh, clear and uh, um, still evolving debate, but very useful for the DPP, I think, but also for all of us who follow Taiwan, even if the conclusions are not all there yet. I want to ask a few questions, then we'll open it up. You spent a lot of time uh, focused on a potential Ma Yingzhou Xi Jinping summit mm -hmm. or higher level mm -hmm. interactions uh, than we've had thus far in cross Straits. Is your concern or is the committee's concern that President Ma will do this kind of summit and not get the right thing for it? Um, or is it more that you're worried he'll pay the wrong price to get a summit? And uh, there's a difference. In other words, if President Ma did a summit with President Xi Jinping but didn't pay a price, didn't accept you know, uh, a more unequivocal 92 consensus or one China formulation as advanced by Beijing mm -hmm. or some other statement mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, that Beijing may want about Japan or the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, or the East China Sea. If he did it and didn't pay any price mm -hmm. to, the, to the Chinese, would your party be okay with it? Or do you still think for a summit he's got to get something back? Mm -hmm. Fewer missiles or, or, some, or some concessions on the 92 consensus? Uh, this is a very good question. And maybe I should yeah. ask your personal opinion, because I know you don't represent everyone on the committee <laughs> or the 500 participants. <laughs> well, in, in, in Taiwan, uh, we joke that uh, in, in the DPP, uh, if there are 
three person, there will be four or five opinions. <laughs> and this is maybe uh, one of those uh, issues uh, in the high level meetings in between Taiwan and China. Some people always feel that uh, you know, we should just cut off the relations. China is being threatened in Taiwan, no matter how kind, what kind of good wills we uh, throw into China. They just continue to build their military threat against Taiwan. They will continue to block Taiwan's international participation and uh, they don't even renounce the use of force against Taiwan. And therefore, some people in Taiwan would very naturally say that uh, you know, we shouldn't do it. But for those who are more serious about the long-term cross-rate development, uh, they would uh, most likely argue that if Taiwan's interest is not affected or Taiwan's interest can be safeguarded, uh, we should look at the uh, very high-level meeting in between Taiwan and China as one of the most important steps toward cross-rate normalization. And I personally will look at it that way. And in order for uh, that cross-rate normalization to take place without Taiwan's interest being uh, tarnished, I think we need to look at some of the things very carefully. But some uh, of this may have happened already. You know, For example, agreeing to the One China Framework. And to the Chinese, this is very clear. One China Framework means Taiwan is part of China. And therefore, agreeing to something that should have come at the end of the negotiation if Taiwan is ready to accept uh, unification with China. Um, but you know, one China framework put out as a condition uh, agreed to the Chinese side for this kind of meeting to take place may not be exactly in Taiwan's interest. And as you can see, when the Wang Yuqi, the MEC chairperson who is about to visit China uh, in February, uh, lots of our legislators uh, especially the DPP side and the TSU side, they don't want Wang Yiqi uh, to speak about One China Framework uh, or anything similar uh, of that nature to prevent Taiwan from being seen, accepted China's conclusion or pre-conclusion of the political negotiations that is not even there yet. Uh, and another thing we need to be very careful about is the Chinese way of uh, doing the maneuver in this kind of uh, high-level meeting. And it took place in 2005 when Lianzhan was in China, and again uh, when uh, James Song was in China. China always prepared um, the joint statement or a consensus or communique for the two sides to make the announcement at the same time. And uh, one of the lessons uh, a lot of people in Taiwan learned a very hard way was just last month. There was a, a media delegation in China participating in that media forum. And the Chinese side just took out one joint statement without consulting the Taiwanese side and said that this is joint statement. So we have to be very careful on what China may put out. And therefore, I would urge Taiwan government to negotiate or to bargain in a very serious way if uh, my joy is to visit China to make sure that when there is a joint statement, the joint statement does not harm Taiwan in any way. And one thing related to your question about Ma Xi meeting is who wants it more? And that is a question that we, we have been asking in Taiwan uh, passionately uh, in some of the uh, forums uh, we had with uh, our own scholars. We cannot even make a final decision on who wants it more. Uh, some people say that uh, it's President Ma uh, who wants a meeting with Xi Jinping. The reason is very simple. His popularity is extremely low, cannot be any lower. And therefore, he needs something to check up his popularity, or at least he has something to tell his uh, chosen or to tell the Taiwan people that he has a legacy. And the legacy is uh, Taiwan-China normalization. But at the same time, there were also very serious scholars on our side saying that, no, it's, it's not President Ma. It's the Chinese side who wants it more. The reason is because you know, China has uh, tension with the United States, with Japan, with, North Korea, with South Korea, with uh, you know, Southeast Asian countries. And Taiwan can be a break for China. And uh, Xi Jinping is so confident in dealing with China now that if uh, Mind Zhou visit China, it will show to the international society that Taiwan now is under China's influence square. So therefore, uh, Xi Jinping really wants uh, the meeting to take place. And the problem for us is that the Xi Jinping may want to frame uh, a, a model of the meeting or the uh, visit uh, to make sure that it's in China's interest. So this is uh, things that we- Complicated. Are, yeah. I, my guess would be 
uh, to answer my own question in terms of U.S. perceptions or perceptions of other Democratic friends of Taiwan, that a cost-free summit would, on balance, be viewed as a positive development, yes. the, the same view you have in principle, in the abstract. Uh, um, but it's also very hard to see, given past Chinese practices, how you get a cost-free summit. Yes, that's right. And I personally um, am not so sure that Xi Jinping wants this mm. uh, as much as some people in Taipei and in, in Taiwan think. Um, you know, Ma, Ma, President Ma uh, is going to be uh, in a very weakened position at the end of his term, in all likelihood, unable to deliver anything mm. considerable through the LY. Um, and for Xi Jinping and the leadership in Beijing, there's a risk mm -hmm. in showing this gesture to Ma and getting nothing, and then there's a DPP win. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure you would know far better. I'm not sure that it would affect necessarily the election in 2016 because Ma is done. Mm -hmm. And the new yep. candidate from the Pan Blue camp will be separating themselves from Ma. So um, I have a sense this isn't going to be a problem because <laughs> I'm okay. not sure that, uh, that Xi Jinping wants this as much as some commentators in Taiwan think. Um, but uh, in the abstract, it, you're, 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 you're right, I think. It's, in the abstract, it could be a positive thing. But it is hard to figure out how this would be done. You know, Vice President Biden, with all the help of the NSC, the State Department, the think tanks around town, um, uh, you know, went to uh, d d d Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, um, tried to carefully manage the message. Mm -hmm. But within the region, Beijing did a really quite skillful job yes. spinning that trip and taking uh, the uh, embrace of a new model of great power relations mm -hmm. and other things to say, we have a joint agreement and consensus with the Americans. Mm -hmm. So it's risky, yes. even though in the abstract it has potential. Uh, let me ask another question. Sure. Um, you say one of the key themes is strengthening ties with other democratic partners. Mm -hmm. And you're concerned that if there is a Ma Xi summit, that a comparable thing wouldn't happen mm -hmm. with other democratic partners. And the reality though is for the major, not your diplomatic allies, but for uh, Japan or a US mm -hmm. or Philippines, President Ma is not going to get a summit. That's just the reality. Okay. So um, if there is a Ma Xi summit, um, it would be difficult to establish balance mm -hmm. in terms of summitry, so you have to look at other tools. You mentioned TPP and RCEP. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I think the TPP mm -hmm. in particular is the way to um, counterbalance or mm -hmm. add ballast mm -hmm. to Taiwan's relations with democratic friends. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me when I travel to Taipei is in the abstract, People who were thoughtful and international like you know that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to the politics of it, I don't get the sense that there's any stomach in either political camp to do some of the hard trade liberalization. Mm -hmm. Doing a free trade agreement with the Americans is like going to the dentist with no Novocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and it takes a real, you know, uh, Noam Hyun did it, and Abe's apparently going to do it, but it takes a real decision, mm -hmm. big, big, hard decisions. Am I wrong about that? Is there a is there a disconnect between the strategic concept and the actual politics, or do you think they could converge in the coming years? Well, I think it's conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, President Ma, in his uh, first announcement of uh, his interest in joining the TPP a couple of years ago, he said that we will join the TPP negotiation in 10 years. Well, it's too long. I mean, he'll be uh, long retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, under pressure, he said that we'll join the TPP negotiations in eight years. It's still too long. And we waited for uh, two more years oh, before you know, he made an announcement uh, very recently that uh, he would urge the uh, government uh, institutions to uh, try to participate in the TPP as soon as possible. And he also asked Vincent Chow, our former vice president, to lead a, a civilian group to study the possibility for Taiwan to join the TPP as soon as possible. And this is a positive step. And I agree that uh, Taiwan should participate in the TPP as soon as possible. And the opposition in Taiwan, the DPP, uh, even though it's, it's natural for the DPP to say things that are opposed to the interests of the ruling government, it, because the reason is because we want to replace the KMT. But on trade issues, this is different. Uh, on uh, Taiwan-New Zealand trade agreement, NSTEC, uh, which was uh, agreed upon earlier last year. Uh, the DPP not only did not oppose yeah. it, we tried to move it up uh, the calendar in the LY sessions so that it could be passed uh, earlier than uh, what was scheduled. Mm. And uh, there was also an agreement in between Taiwan and Singapore, the ASTEP, 
the Singaporean government was very good in briefing us uh, what it's all about, and uh, we agree that uh, that is a very important agreement uh, in between Taiwan and another economy, and therefore we support it full-heartedly. And if there uh, can be uh, another FTA in between Taiwan with any other economies, and I think the DPP is going to uh, come up with the same spirit that will support the, T the, the FTAs with any other country. And for the TPP, uh, I don't know whether you remember what uh, Chair Su, oh, uh, the Chair Su came over here and uh, delivered a uh, speech in the Brookings, uh, jointly held by the CSIs and, and the Brookings. And in that speech, he talked about the need for Taiwan to participate in the TPP. And he spoke about that several times uh, when he went back to Taiwan. And last week, uh, we also had a report by the director of our international department on uh, the lessons learned from Japan and Korea in the pursuing FTAs and the TPP. And we're studying very carefully on the, what kind of programs do we need to be prepared, uh, what kind of things Taiwan needs to engage in uh, voluntarily in order for Taiwan to be accepted by the partners of the TPP as, as a responsible partner. And of course, there are things the government should do and can do right away. You know, For example, the structural reform, make investment in the upgrade of our industries or streamline our rules and regulations, which is too complicated and too cumbersome. And we need to uh, simplify the bureaucratic procedures. You know, some of the uh, international corporations in uh, Taiwan uh, finds life very difficult because they have to deal with uh, very complicated bureaucracies. Uh, sometimes we, we should just go to one bureaucracy and say, say, I want to do this, and they should return with uh, that bureaucracy. But in Taiwan, there's chops. You know, you have to have 100 chops, 200 chops in order to get one thing done. It's just not right for us to continue to do that. And uh, we have made uh, concrete suggestions uh, in the uh, Central Standing Committee report that we need to pursue TPP, but there are things we need to do right away and we are urging the government to do them. And finally, before I open it up, you, um, you gave a very clear um, and very, I don't want to sound pejorative, but clever, <laughs> uh, skillful, I should say, uh, description of the China Committee's and the party's position on these existential questions about one China mm -hmm. definition, 92 consensus constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were very clear that, it, you know, de facto, mm -hmm. Taiwan has its own uh, mm -hmm. president and so forth. And as a democracy, these things have to be decided democratically. But you also said issues like constitutionalism are still on the table, could be discussed. Mm -hmm. If we invite you back in a year or in two years, should we expect answers on those? Or is it more realistic to expect that um, those issues are going to wait until after 2016 as a general mm -hmm. matter? Well, I, I would say that uh, the members of the committee are very eager in taking on those uh, very serious issues. Uh, we understand that uh, those are the issues that we have to confront. Uh, otherwise, you know, when we get closer to the election, it will be more difficult mm -hmm. for us to deal with those questions. And we have to deal with those questions uh, before the election, the uh, 2016 election rolls along. Uh, you know, we can take off those uh, you know, emotional factor out of the discussion, uh, the better. And uh, according to some of uh, those participants in the uh, committee meeting, uh, we need to think about constitution as a consensus or as a basis for the cross rate dialogues, uh, which is proposed by Frank Xie. He always has that idea. Uh, in one of the expanded meetings, uh, he tossed out that idea, but that was overthrown uh, and been turned into consensus on constitutionalism. Uh, but the participants in the last Thursday's uh, committee meeting, they feel that uh, that is too complicated for the people to understand and that might not be good enough, especially the Chinese spokesperson for the uh, Taiwan Affairs Office has already came out and rejected that and therefore we need to think of something new. Uh, Chairwoman Tsai thought that uh, it's good for us to think about the formulation Taiwan equals to Republic of China, Republic of China you know, equals to Taiwan. And the reason is quite simple. Is, you know, when we talk about the Republic of China, that has that uh, linkage with uh, the uh, Chinese uh, concept of one China, even though the Republic of China in Taiwan is being accepted as uh, something that is different from China. Uh, and therefore, you can see that uh, people in the committee 
are very interested to take on these fundamental issues and come up with a, a new formulation or a new concept to serve as a basis for cross-strait dialogues. This may be inaccurate from your perspective, but my takeaway politically about this is you, 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 you said part of the point is to take the emotionalism out of these issues before the election, but I always thought Taiwan elections were about putting emotionalism in <laughs> before the election to turn out the base, something uh, which may have become a little more of a liability mm -hmm. for both parties. So that's why I think there's some real credibility to this. Mm -hmm. Something the Republican Party is sort of figuring out now, too. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Taiwan's issue. Let me open it up. Please uh, identify yourself. And uh, yes, sir. We have cam uh, uh, microphones, right? Thank you. Yeah, John Zan with CTI TV. Uh, Joseph, welcome back. I have a, uh, um, uh, Joseph, what do you think of the, um, um, the reaction from Beijing to the uh, result of the review? And also, while you, were, you are in town here, have you met with administration officials? What is their reaction to the review, particularly the, the result of the review? I also have a question for Mike, if I may. Uh, Mike, you said uh, in your opening that uh, the review um, um, is a uh, revolutionary step. Evolution. Evolutionary. Evolution. Uh, evolutionary. I don't want to get him in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> evolutionary. Yeah, Mike, what is it in the review or in the result of the review that you think is, is significant from the U.S. perspective? Thank you very much. Take on those. Well, uh, for the Chinese reactions, uh, the Taiwan Affairs Office issued a press statement right after we made public the uh, 2014 uh, China Policy Review. But when I look at the uh, response from the Chinese side, it's, it's the way I would describe it is a knee-jerk response. You know, it's a quick response, a typical response, traditional way of responding to uh, the DPP's initiative. Uh, they responded to things like uh, we use um, national security as an excuse to block cross-rate normal exchanges, which is not true. Okay? And they also say that the, we use uh, core value to incite um, you know, Taiwan's uh, nationalism against China, uh, things like that, which is also untrue. Uh, and, and the way I look at the, the Chinese response is still quite moderate. It's not screaming off the roof. Uh, against this report. And I think there's still room for us to uh, make exchanges with China. Uh, we have uh, plenty of scholars who uh, can have uh, opportunities to engage the Chinese scholars. And uh, I'm sure they will study this document in a much careful manner than the immediate response from the Taiwan Affairs Office. After all, there are quite a few uh, what I would call goodwills or goodwill gestures uh, to the Chinese side, and I'm sure they can, uh, they will uh, catch them. And the second question uh, that you asked me about the meetings with U.S. officials, you know, you have been covering this news for a long time. You know the rules. I cannot speak about it. We speak with uh, U.S. officials from time to time, but we cannot speak about who that is or what we spoke about. Well, in general reaction up until today, uh, speaking with uh, friends in the United States, uh, including uh, some of uh, the friends in the think tanks, I think they uh, have an appreciation of how hard the DPP has been working on this. And uh, for the U.S. officials, I, again, I would urge you to ask the U.S. officials rather than you know, coming from me. It would, be, it would not be nice for me to uh, say what they say. I'm not currently a U.S. official, but, but for you, I'll play one on TV. Uh, I mean, uh, from my own perspective, this is evolutionary because it's reasonable. It's not complete. It leaves a lot of big unanswered questions that are pretty fundamental, but it's reasonable. And, um, you know, frankly, I think the view when I was in the administration was, to be honest, Joseph, from time to time, um, the DPP uh, put out statements that were uh, uh, highly insensitive <laughs> mm -hmm. to uh, responses in the US or Japan, let alone China. This reads as a document that's carefully calibrated to demonstrate that the DPP is uh, going to be responsible, no surprises, um, doesn't answer all the questions, but the US can feel confident that there's um, a sensitivity to US interests here in US-Taiwan relations. It's quite clear to me. Um, and the mood music is better generally in terms of the uh, opening paragraphs. So, you know, I. It's interesting you 
thought I said revolutionary. I don't think a revolutionary document, my own personal opinion, I don't think a revolutionary document would be helpful. Because sometimes if you break the consensus in a political party, you have another group spin off that's even more radical and unhelpful. So I, you know, this is, this is uh, poor Joseph's herding cats. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's in the right direction. Thank you. But not complete yet. You were a professor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. Thank you. I'm Andre Sobozo, and I'm the uh, chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company in Detroit, Michigan. Anyway, wonderful presentation. What my, oh, wonderful. I, my uh, question is this. Um, could you, how does you see the President Obama's uh, so-called pivot to the Pacific, that is the deployment of extra assets, naval assets, into the area, uh, friendship visits to Vietnam and the Philippines, um, that kind of thing, and, and the, um, uh, what else he, 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 oh, and stationing Marines in the, in the uh, Australia, that kind of overall, how does this, is this a positive impact from Taiwan's standpoint, from the DPP standpoint, or, or not? Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, for the DPP perspective, we welcome the U.S. rebalance in uh, East Asia. We welcome the U.S. paying much more attention than before uh, what's going on in East Asia. And we welcome the strengthening of uh, U.S.-Japan uh, Security Alliance relationship. Uh, we would welcome uh, the United States sending Marines to Australia and seeing the uh, alliance relations strengthen. Uh, we are very happy to see that the United States is, you know, from a long-term perspective, will have more than 50% of its fleet uh, stationed in the West Pacific. And I think to us, this is a very reassuring. Um, you know, for all this time, the United States want Taiwan to engage China, but we want to engage China with confidence. And I think this is the kind of action that will provide Taiwan with lots of confidence in engaging China. But at the same time, a lot of people in Taiwan also worry that uh, uh, maybe Taiwan and uh, the pivot or the rebalance may not be uh, exactly in line with each other. You know, for example, the U.S. is strengthening its security relations with Japan, with the Philippines, with Vietnam, with Australia. But how about the security relations uh, between the United States and, and, and Taiwan? Uh, we haven't been able to get F-16 CDs, uh, and we haven't been able to discuss with the U.S. on uh, other advanced defensive weapons. And there, we seem to have some difficulties in the discussing with the United States for future generations of Taiwan defense need. And therefore, it seems to me that uh, tai Taiwan does not seem to be in line with this overall trend in the U.S. pivot or rebalance. Uh, but at the same time, I also heard it from uh, Pentagon officials that uh, there are all kinds of uh, cooperations between Taiwan and the United States, and that is the kinds of things we want to see. And the DPP pays attention to Taiwan's own defense, and we published the first set of uh, defense blue papers in June last year. And we will have uh, the second set coming up at the end of February. And that's not the end of our effort. And in the process of preparing for our uh, defense blue papers, we try to draw those uh, uh, retired military officials into the discussion. And we also ask the uh, American friends to come in for the discussion. And I think the purpose is very clear. If arms sale becomes difficult, we have to rely on ourselves. And if Taiwan wants to continue to be a good partner, a faithful partner of the United States, we should be seen by the United States as willing to pick up its own defense. David. Welcome. Hi, my, my name is David Sedney. Uh, my question is about the South China Sea. As you look in your neighborhood, the South China Sea is an area where a lot of people see potential for uh, competition and perhaps even conflict. Uh, what's your view, what's the view of the party on the South China Sea, and, and specifically, what's your view on the Nine Dash Line? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dave, for your question. And it's always very good to see you. And uh, he is always one of those people we can uh, count on for uh, good exchange on security issues. And uh, thank you very much for asking that question. Uh, South China Sea, uh, in the way many people in Taiwan look at it, as uh, you know, probably more dangerous situation than the East China Sea. The reason is because it's much more complicated. 
and uh, China's uh, power projection ability is much higher than uh, other countries in uh, Southeast Asia. And therefore, if there's going to be a conflict in between China and uh, Southeast Asian countries in the South China Sea area, uh, it's going to be uh, not easy for the United States or any country uh, that is willing to come in and try to help those countries. Uh, just try not to forget about the uh, Scarborough Shore uh, incidents. The Chinese uh, Coast Guard ships just came in and took control of the area and there was nothing the Philippines uh, could do about it. And therefore, this is uh, one area that we need to pay attention to. And Taiwan happens to be in control of the largest island in the South China Sea, Taiping Island. And therefore, you know, we cannot stay out of the picture. Uh, but the difficult thing for Taiwan is that uh, there's no other country that is willing to negotiate with Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan keep asking that uh, we should participate in the multilateral forum, but uh, the multilateral forum just wouldn't accept Taiwan. And we've been asking individual countries in uh, Southeast Asia to negotiate with Taiwan faithfully in order to uh, have a peaceful resolution. But uh, those countries uh, just wouldn't speak to Taiwan. Uh, but I think the DPP's position has, uh, you know, long-standing position, position has been very clear. Uh, Taiwan should be included in the negotiations because we are in control of uh, one of the largest or the largest island of the area and we are also in control of uh, some other islands uh, in uh, South China Sea and therefore uh, a resolution without including Taiwan is just unrealistic and uh, we also see the conflict should be resolved in a peaceful way through peaceful dialogues and uh, we also see that uh, the free passages or free navigation uh, should be the principle for all the countries before a resolution is found and uh, we also argue that we should follow the international law of the sea uh, to resolve the differences among all these countries. Nadia? <coughs> Hi, uh, Nadia Chao, uh, Washington correspondent for Liberty Time. Joseph, welcome back. And also in your uh, paper mentioned that uh, DPP is going to seek a Taiwan consensus on this issue. And we know this might be the most difficult one, even for, you know, um, but maybe even you know more difficult than a cross-strait dialogue. So when you when DPP is talking about Taiwan consensus, does that mean that a consensus with the KMT as well? Because it's hard to imagine uh, you know a consensus just one, among one party, but it's also hard to imagine that that will be initiated by an opposition party to have a consensus with the ruling party. So what do you in mind? Thank you. Well, this is a very tough question, and I should agree that Nadia always asks yes. very tough but very good questions. And uh, Taiwan consensus is something uh, that has been a toast around beginning from uh, 2011, uh, and that idea has always been there, uh, even though there are some uh, discussions or debate on what Taiwan consensus is. But if we run public opinion surveys, uh, actually, it's not that difficult to find real Taiwan consensus on sovereignty issues or on other thorny issues. You know, for example, on sovereignty issue, majority of the people in Taiwan feel that uh, you know, Taiwan is already independent with national title, the Republic of China. Majority people agree with that. Uh, majority of the people uh, in Taiwan agree that Taiwan is already an independent uh, country. Uh, majority of the people feel that uh, the future of Taiwan should remain independent. And this is Taiwan consensus. No problem with it majority of the people have already spoken. Uh, and there's also a majority, absolute majority of Taiwan people says that uh, we should participate in international affairs, international organizations. And this is also a uh, Taiwan consensus. Uh, for a formulation uh, for Taiwan to be able to dialogue with China, uh, that might be a little bit more difficult for Taiwan because the Chinese side always ask for uh, one China principle or anything that relates to one China principle. But that issue that doesn't have a consensus in Taiwan, but that doesn't mean that there cannot be any consensus. Uh, for example, in last Thursday's uh, committee meeting, there were some good ideas being tossed around. You know, for example, Taiwan equals to ROC, ROC equals to Taiwan, or some uh, other uh, members of the committee uh, argue that we should have a constitution to serve as the foundation for that dialogues. And of course, uh, the main part of our constitution uh, set up uh, was taken from the 1948 constitution. 
the Chinese side would be easy to point to that constitution as having that uh, one China connotation. But any kind of consensus in Taiwan that can be called Taiwan consensus should not deviate from the majority view. If we try to do something or say something and say that this is a consensus, Taiwan consensus, uh, without majority of the people in Taiwan agreeing to it, it's, it's not going to be a very good consensus. And therefore, we need to uh, be very careful in steering to our course in uh, finding a consensus on the basis for the cross-strait dialogues. And you say that uh, it might be difficult uh, to formulate consensus in between the KMT and the DPP or between the Pen Blue and the Pen Green. Yes, it's very difficult these days in Taiwan's political landscape. Uh, virtually everything the Pen Green is on, the Pen Blue will oppose it and likewise, uh, you know, in, or vice versa. But there are things the two sides can agree upon. You know, for example, our uh, trade relations with uh, New Zealand and trade relations with uh, Singapore. The two sides have no disagreement with each other. And on the service trade agreement, uh, there was also a very easy agreement in the legislative end. They signed a written agreement uh, saying that it has to go through a series of public hearings. And President Martin did not like it. And then he asked the legislative end to uh, rediscuss it. And the legislative end reconvened and re-agreed that the, the series of public hearings have to uh, complete. And therefore, it's not as difficult as uh, it no, normally would imagine uh, that there will be a consensus in between the green and blue uh, as long as there are good discussions. And I'm sure the PEM green and the PEM blue can come to a consensus on some of the thorny issues. Uh, you know, we try to invite Su Chi, uh, one of the people that the DPP side love to hate. Uh, you know, I invited him to come to uh, the expanded meeting and he agreed to come and uh, it was a very polite manner that the, he and the DPP folks exchanged views with each other and we also invited uh, Zhao Chun San uh, you know he is also from the Kenti side he publicly says that he's one of those advisors uh, to President Ma on cross -right relations and he agreed to come uh, even though we may not agree with each other 100%, but at least we are able to exchange with each other. And as long as those kinds of exchanges continue, I'm sure there can be some agreements in between the greens and blues on some of the fundamental issues. Uh, just give you a newest uh, example of uh, agreement being possible. That was about Wang Yichi's visit to China. Uh, he made a report to Speaker Wang, and Speaker Wang convened a closed-door session uh, with uh, the uh, key leaders from uh, different parties' caucus, uh, and, and they agreed very quickly on a resolution, binding resolution attached to the general budget, that when Wang Yichi goes to China, he should not address on political issues like One China Framework or agree to negotiate with China on ending civil war or peace agreement, things like that. And that goes back to my argument that if we really try, you know, there can be consensus in Taiwan. Yes, sir, up front here. Hi, Joseph. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, you. The report was characterized as evolution, right? Am I right? Now, in this process of evolution, I suspect there must, must have some descending minority view within the party. Can you explain to us, is there any significant opposing view or descending view when you discuss this China policy issue? Mm -hmm. uh, they're always like that in the DPP, uh, and, and it's not as easy to formulate a majority view and um, you know, I led a, a group of staffers in uh, coming up with this China policy review, and the process is not easy. You have to go through the discourse, uh, the discussions, uh, through those uh, expanded meetings in order to come up with uh, this uh, China policy review. And there are a lot of things that uh, good ideas uh, toss around in uh, the expanded meetings, but they are not majority view, and therefore we just seem to uh, leave them alone. Uh, some of those ideas uh, being floating around, including, uh, for example, freezing the Taiwan independence platform 
that was a minority view in the expanded meeting. And uh, when uh, that idea was presented again in the committee meeting, again, that was a very minority view. Uh, and uh, I would say the uh, constitution to serve as a consensus uh, or consensus on constitution to serve as a cross-strait uh, dialogues uh, foundation is also not a majority view. And I think we need to work very hard or you know, that uh, particular political leader need to work uh, very much harder than before in order to persuade other uh, leaders in the DPP to accept his view. But I think you know, uh, no matter what kind of um, views uh, that has been aired in the DPP, uh, the DPP has always been a democratic and open political party. Uh, you can see people like Julian Guo, uh, Guo Zhengliang, uh, he criticized the DPP all the time. Sometimes he criticized the DPP itself harder than the KMT guys, uh, but he's still in the DPP. It's not like the KMT. The DPP is an open political party. Any kind of ideas can be tossed around, and if uh, they are attractive enough, I'm sure they will become a majority view. Uh, thank you very much for good presentations. My name is Leonid Tisichny. I study international relations, global affairs. In my life in many countries, I met many uh, Taiwanese. All of them dream about unifications. I don't meet another Taiwanese. It's a one side. Another side, China never says that they attack Taiwan. Cultural, political, uh, economic relations prove uh, that China says the truth. Now, questions. Why Taiwan, having no enemies around, it, China is not enemy? Help uh, increase. You say that they increase. Uh, try all time increase uh, from budget, budget for defense, defense, defense against whom? Better this money move to development industry, to development better relations between China and Taiwan, uh, to go to another way, change directions of mentality, stop enemies speaking enemy enemy and you said that is enemy and no i not agree with you china is not enemy of taiwan and future is one country so i suggest change politics in declaring that we have no military intentions we don't have any enemies and we country without army without uh, any uh, uh, money from budget na for defense. In so, this case, will be much better by my idea. Uh, you cannot agree, uh, but I, I think in your case, it's a specific case because Ireland in other. So I think I know what the answer to this is going to be. Is total. <laughs> okay. I think I know what the answer to this is going to be, but. Well, whether China threatens Taiwan or not, it's, it's a reality. You know, they build up uh, so many uh, different type of forces specifically against Taiwan. Uh, just one instance, they have uh, built more than 1,500 missiles, uh, including ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, geared specifically at Taiwan. And they are also building uh, transportation uh, ships. Uh, in order to transport a large number of uh, troops across the Taiwan Strait. And this is all real. So to Taiwan, uh, we have to maintain our defense capability. And the reason is not because we want to attack Taiwan. The reason is because we want to be able to safeguard ourselves to prevent Taiwan from becoming an attraction for the Chinese aggression. Uh, but at the same time, uh, defense uh, is something that we want to uh, pay attention to. We also want to uh, reach out to China, to reconcile with China, to prevent a situation from getting worse. China's own 2005 anti-secession law states that under certain circumstances, as a matter of law, China will use force. So uh, that's out there. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we look at uh, mm -hmm. the Chinese uh, you know, intention as something is yang mo, it's, it's open yeah. uh, character. Uh, it's not yin mo, it's not conspiracy. We, we always ask China to be transparent and... They're very transparent and they're intentional with yeah. Taiwan. 
Thank you, Mr. Wu. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency. And yesterday, uh, when Chairman Su had an interview with the Central Radio, he mentioned uh, China plus one. Mm -hmm. From your understanding, what does he mean? Is it a kind of message that he would like to send to the mainland China to see any reaction from Beijing, or is a kind of new concept that could be discussed between the both sides? Thank you. Uh, China plus one is not a new concept. I'm sure Mike knows it very well. A lot of Japanese business people, uh, they made investment in China and they feel that uh, maybe that's, there's a risk associated with it. And therefore they want to have some investment in a different country to diversify their risk. This is called China plus one formula. And I think we were trying to tell the Taiwanese business people uh, if they want to make investment in China, they need to think about their uh, potential risk. Uh, and it'll be good for them to have investment in a different country as well. But at the same time, we're trying to reassure to China, it's not just pulled out from China altogether or you know, just to uh, gear uh, at China with all kinds of hostility. And this is a peaceful message to China and this meant goodwill. Uh, Joseph, thank you. Um, uh, if you do have more concrete answers to some of the core questions, we'd certainly be happy to have you back. And um, I, as I said, I think this is a reasonable document, document and moves the debate in a good direction. Clausewitz argued in international relations that you know, national security depends on the military power, the economic power, allies, mm -hmm. but also internal cohesion. Yes. And I've often worried that one of Taiwan's real vulnerabilities is lack of internal cohesion. This helps. Mm -hmm. um, and under President Ma, if you look at opinion polls, for a variety of reasons, I think President Ma deserves some credit, um, the polls show there is, as you pointed out, some convergence as well. Mm -hmm. It's a democracy. Mm -hmm. It's a rambunctious democracy. A real consensus would be kind of boring. Yeah. Um, but this, uh, <laughs> but, this, but this, this is an important step. So thank you for sharing it well, with thank us. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs>